Welcome. Welcome all of you in this room to Aspen Institute's Aspen Meadows Conference Center at Aspen, Colorado. And also welcome to all of you who will be watching this on video or on the internet or anywhere else. This gathering is entitled Selling Without Selling Out. Lessons learned by the founders of socially responsible businesses bought by multinationals. The reason we're coming together here is for two reasons. The first one is for each of us who were founders of companies that ended up selling to multinationals to say what we learned in the process of selling our company and what we wish we had learned that we didn't understand or know at the time. And the reason we're doing this is so that the next generation of people who will end up in the situation, as many will, of selling their companies to multinationals for whatever reason, we don't care what the reason is, we just care about having them know what we've learned and can be helpful to them about doing that. So that's the first purpose. The second purpose is, on the last session of the, of the couple days together, we're going to brainstorm what we see as the next stages of maturity of socially responsible businesses. There's many things happening and we want to bubble all those up so that we can have everybody know what we know is going on right now because some of them are very exciting things that are happening. My name is Terry Molnar. I'm the president of Trusteeship Institute, which is a nonprofit organization and consulting firm that specializes in researching and developing socially responsible businesses. I'm also one of the founders with Wayne Silby of the Calvert Social Investment Mutual Funds. I'm also on the board of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. As you know, I was one of the people who worked with 25 other people to try to buy Ben & Jerry's uh, in the year 2000 and eventually it got bought by Unilever and I ended up on the board of directors. Well, you'll hear all about the Ben & Jerry's story tomorrow and it's very complex and so you'll understand more about it. I'm also 63 years old. That means I'm one of the earliest baby boomers. I was a child in the 1940s and the 1950s. Those were the days after the Depression, after World War II, after the Korean War, when everybody was focusing on surviving and moving up and conforming. I can remember when the ice truck brought a block of ice to our house every morning to put in our ice box. I can remember when we got our first refrigerator. I can remember when we got our first washing machine, our first dryer, our first television set. And I remember, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, and I can remember when it was unusual for women to drive. I'm old. <laughs> so, what I want you to understand is that in the 1960s, when I was a teenager, and then the, when I was in my 20s, my generation had a temper tantrum, as we all know. And we had a temper tantrum against all the dogmas we'd been brought up in, all that conformity. We took science to heart. We decided we'd go to our own personal experiences to find truth. And so we charted a whole lot of new courses which drove a lot of our parents crazy. I'm proud to say I think I was one of the first hippies in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> um, what, we, what we did is we fought the Vietnam, against the Vietnam War, we fought for women's rights, we fought against racism. We did all these things because we believed according to our conscience it was the right thing to do. We also began to get co-ed dorms, we started food cooperatives, and we started socially responsible businesses. When, uh, when we started these socially responsible businesses, our concern was the dogma that existed in the business community. In that business community, the dogma at that time was that the highest priority was the financial interest of the shareholder owners. We took a look at all of this and said, this doesn't feel right to us. We had grown up acting according to our conscience. That's one of the things we held on to. And so we took our personal science approach and began to take a look at things a little bit differently. And we knew what was meant by conscience. We knew that what was meant by conscience was that we were to give priority to the good of all and second priority to our own self-interest. We were to do both fully, but we were never to forget what the right priorities were. We took that to heart. And so we began to look at the business sector and said, hmm, 
we don't really think it's a good idea to separate what happens to the environment, what happens to the community, what happens to the employees from this idea of giving priority to making a profit. That was the essence and the beginning of what I think we today call socially responsible business. We all, it also came from our spiritual perspective. In all religions and spiritual, spiritual teachings begin with this basic idea that you give priority to the good of all and second priority to your own self-interest. To act according to our conscience. In fact, my father, whenever he gave us a birthday present or signed any kind of a card, he always drew a bunch of circles on top of one another, he drew a stem, for, this was to indicate a rose, he drew a stem, he put three leaves on it, he put two dots in the rose, and he only, always said to all six of his kids, remember, that's God watching you to make sure that you're following your conscience. So, we started these new businesses. Ben Cohen, Jerry Greenfield, Jeff Furman, and others started Ben & Jerry's up in Burlington, Vermont in the 1970s. They were not only a socially responsible business, they wore their politics on their sleeves and they shouted it from the housetops. I remember when a man named K um, Sam Kamen came to the board meeting of the Boston Food Cooperative and said, I want to start a yogurt company and I'd like you to help me out. It's going to be called Stonyfield Farms Yogurt and my friend Gary Hirschberg is going to help me start it and I've named it after my farm. That was the beginning of Stonyfield, uh, Stonyfield Farm Yogurt. Then Bob Swan and, and I got together and created the Institute for Community Economics in the mid-1970s. And one of my projects was to bring people together. We brought 15 to 20 leaders of, of the social kind of community together to write the first social screens for investment. We were concerned about bringing a bunch of the foundation kind of money together and then making loans to what we call low-income housing programs today and the social enterprises and we had all these plans in place. I invited a friend of mine that I'd met named Wayne Silby to join that group. One day Wayne flew up to uh, Massachusetts and we took a long, long walk in the park and Wayne and I were talking and uh, I said, you know, I had a professor in college who said that the best way to teach somebody something was to try to sell them something because they always paid attention when you were trying to sell them something. Wayne stopped on the path and he turned to me and he said, whoa, if that's true, then we should set up a mutual fund where anybody could invest $1,000 and invest with these social screens that we've been writing so that a lot of people would learn about this rather than just having the Ford Foundation invest in our project. Wayne's and I, my eyes met and we knew at that instant we were going to do something for our generation. A few months later, Wayne called me and said, let's set it up inside my company as an extension of his company, which was the Calvert Group that he and John Guffey had started, which mainly was involved with money market funds at that point. So all these things began to happen. There was Toms of Maine, there was The Body Shop, there was uh, so many, Aveda, there were so many others, social responsible businesses began to come into existence. So now here we are, and many of these businesses that I've just named have all been sold to multinationals. Vada boom. What does that mean? Did the socially responsible businesses change? Did the multinationals change? What happened? Because we started these against what we saw as the values of the multinational. This is what we're going to dig into. We're going to try to see what's happened that's caused this to happen and looks like it's going to happen a lot more. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to spend some time taking a look at the future what we see is the next stages of development of social responsible businesses. Ha ha. There's many things that are happening right now and I'm just going to name a few of them for you. Muhammad Yunus, Yunus has proposed something he calls social business. A social business is a business that where the investors don't make a return and the business is a business and it's involved with some social mission. Another one is B Corp. Our friend J. Cohen Gilbert has started this organization where your business can join this organization and where you make a commitment to care about all the stakeholders and you put it in your articles of incorporation so it becomes part of who you are. He has over a hundred companies I think involved in this at this point. Then there's Google.org. Yes, when Larry Page and Sergey Brim started Google.com 
they put in the prospectus that 1% of the, of the stock and 1% of the annual profits would be set aside and managed for the common good in some way. They decided when they had a billion dollars that they should do something with this. And they decided that, hmm, we don't want to just do like other people and set up a foundation and do charitable educational things. We want to do more exciting things. So they decided to set up Google.org, which is a for-profit company. The task of Google.org is to make a profit, lose money, make a big profit, break even. They don't care. The highest priority is to op give priority to the common good. Right back to that idea of the conscience again. Back to what we, call, we used to call moral order. And the exciting thing about it is that they're doing it with a billion dollars. So I see this as one of the first common good investment funds because they're going to invest in companies as well as build their own kind of companies. We at Trusteeship Institute have proposed something called the Common Good Corporation. The Common Good Corporation is a corporation that gives priority to putting a cap on the return on equity and having the excess every year permanently set aside and managed for the good of society. Now the cap on the equity could be whatever the risk reward makes it reasonable to be. So it could be 25% or more in a startup situation for the investors, and then it could work its way down to be like 11% or 12% or even less. Why 11, 12%? Why would we like to mature companies to get down to 11, 12%? That's because most financial planners in the world say to their clients, we're going to try to get you an 8 to 11% return on your investment. If we get common good corporations coming down to where they're at the 11, 12%, and they even guarantee that if they don't make it one year, they'll make up it for the next year, just all the excess will always be permanently set aside. I think there's lots of financial planners would want to put that, some of that into the portfolio of their clients. There's another thing to think about when you think about what Google's doing and what the Common Good Corporation stands for. Just like Google.org is a common good investment fund, people all over the world could set up common good investment funds. For the first time on the history of the planet, we would have many investment funds that would all have the exact same highest priority, which is the common good. What would be the main thing these, these funds would do? They would buy companies and convert them to be common good corporations. So there'd be more of them. So there'd be a cash flow to do this. What's exciting about this kind of thinking that is progressing is that if the common good corporations decide to get together to buy a large company, they could each put up less than 10% of their portfolio to pool together to buy a multinational. So let's say in, right now in the United States you have four main stationary companies. Staples, Office Max, Office Depot, and Mason Brothers. So if the common good investment funds pooled their capital and came along and bought Staples, the three remaining would be very concerned about the financial interest of their shareholders. And if this began to take off the way the environmental movement has taken off, They'd want to make sure they weren't the last one to sell to this new thing that's coming down the pike. So they'd be like a feeding frenzy to not be the last one sold. The reason I'm pointing this out is that there's lots of different things that are happening that are moving us in a direction that just like, I, I was at Earth Day in 1970 on the Boston Common, the first Earth Day, okay? We didn't know the words recycling. We didn't know the words ecology. We didn't know the words sustainability. We didn't know the words even environment very well. It's now less than 40 years later. Nearly everyone on the planet is thinking about the environment now. All the multinationals are thinking about it, whether it's from offense because they care or defense because of the rays of consciousness. Within 40 years, I believe we could end up with many common good corporations all over the, all over the planet that would all be cooperating together with nonprofits and governments to make this planet a better place in the private sector. So that's some of the kind of things that we can talk about. There's something called social enterprises. There's Jed Emerson's uh, blended value program. There's lots of different other things, and so we can get into some of those later. There's one more thing I want to point out, and that is China. China is, there's 33 multinationals in China. 32 of them are owned by the government. China's figured out that it's more important on the planet to have, behave like a corporation than it is to behave like a nation. 
So they're going around the planet and buying up natural resources in the ground or companies that own natural resources. Other nations have taken a look at this. And they've, real, they've set up something called sovereign funds, which is an investment fund where the, set up by the, com, by the country. There's trillions of dollars in just the last year that have gone into, so, into sovereign funds. And they are going around and buying up companies as well. So guess which is the last country on the planet that would probably be comfortable setting up a sovereign fund? Be the US of A. Our people would easily see it as socialism or worse. Also, think about Western companies. We would easily sell to the highest bidder, often without thinking of our national interest. So this is a thing that could cause some people to have concern, and even though The Economist magazine says it's nothing to worry about, we can imagine how it could grow and change into something quite substantial. So today, uh, employees do not have very much leverage. We were just talking about this in the Ben and Jerry's board meeting. Employees do not have much leverage vis-a-vis -vis the companies. They're weak. The unions are weak around the planet. But the multinationals are very, very strong. They're very strong. And they have lots of power over governments. Hmm. Are we going to have all the nations of the planet get together and make an agreement to change the ratio of salaries versus profits? I don't think so. Not too soon. But the nature of the process so far, because as you know, people who are in salaried positions at the lower 50% of the salary scales, in constant dollars, their salaries haven't gone up very much since 1970, 37 years ago. The S&P 500 made an average annual return of 15% from 1982 to 1998. People who were making unearned income made a lot of money through their investments. People who were doing earned income made very little and it's been getting smaller and smaller. In the 1970s and 80s, families in the United States said, wow, we need to maintain our standard of living, so the spouses went to work. In the 1990s and the aughts, people said, we can get more money by getting a home equity loan. People's values of their houses went way up. There's not another place to go to get more money now, to maintain your standard of living. And if you've got teenagers, you know how important it is to maintain your iPod standard of living. So I'm an optimist. I know when all is said and done, the land will be here, the buildings will be here, the people will be here, and we will have solved it. We will have figured it out. But what I also know is what we do in the private sector is going to be a very big player in this solution. A very big player. So I think there's three things we need to be aware of. One, we need to stimulate far more socially responsible companies coming into existence. They can incrementally continue to move the envelope. Remember, what changed our environmental consciousness on the planet was not because some multinationals took the lead, was not because you know, a few teenagers took the lead, it was because all of us played a role in whatever small or large way we had to raise the consciousness about what was obvious, which is we had to take care of this planet before we destroyed it. Well, what we need to have happen is many more socially responsible companies come into existence and people talk about it. So everybody will play a role. The customers, the employees, the suppliers, the investors, everyone plays a role in raising the consciousness of how important it is for us to have our businesses act according to our conscience. The second thing is the multinationals need to start to incrementally doing what they can to do this. One company can't do it. That's all a part of this raising of consciousness again we have to begin to do. It'll be very difficult for multinationals to do that. They have a legal obligation to give priority to the financial interest of their shareholders. When we were doing the Ben and Jerry's deal, as many of us in the room here know, we sat with the biggest merger, uh, merger acquisition law firm in the country, and they clearly told us that if we got sued, the judge would find in favor of the minority investors if, if, if the uh, board sold the company to my group at $38 a share when there was a $40 share on the table, that we would lose because the financial interests of the shareholders are, are paramount. So the multinationals would have a hard time changing. They'd have to do a lot of work with all those publicly held shares out there to make a change. But they could begin to realize that it's part of the, of the good of the company as well as the society and play a significant role if they wanted to as consciousness changed. 
The last thing that has to happen in the private sector is more common good corporations, more Google.orgs, more co uh, uh, common good uh, investment funds, all working together to make this world a better place. So those are some of the things that I think are on the, on, on the, on the heading for us. The last thing I want to say to you is that in 1979, I toured all over India and I was able to interview all the people still alive who'd worked closely with Mahatma Gandhi. And when I met with this old man down in Kerala, he told me this story. And frankly, I've never been able to document that the story was accurate. And I don't know if he was telling me the story because it was true or because he just wanted to make a point. But it's a very interesting story. What he said is Mahatma Gandhi had an exchange with Mao Zedong. And the exchange was that Gandhi wrote Mao Zedong and said, your system's not going to work. Mao Zedong wrote back and said, what do you mean? I'm giving priority to the good of all the people. And Gandhi wrote back and said, yes, it's very good that you're giving priority to the good of all the people. However, the next stage of maturity will build on individual freedom, not take it away. I think it's crucial that we realize that it's the private sector, it's socially responsible companies that are going to provide substantial leadership for us to move to the next stage of maturity of capitalism, of our societies, and of all of these things by freely choosing to give priority to the common good. And what is the common good? We're all going to end up in that conversation, aren't we? Who knows? What we do know is if we give priority to having the conversation about what is the common good because it, we believe it should be our highest priority because of our spiritual, religious, conscience, scientific learnings, we'll begin to find out. And we'll figure out what is the common good together because we'll all be freely choosing to cooperate to find out what it is so nobody's going to be able to tell anybody else what it is. So I'm glad you're here tonight so, us, so we can have these conversations. And I believe the day will come when no child's going to be born on this planet that doesn't realize that the common good is the highest priority of private companies everywhere.